Well, hey, good morning. If you would, make your way back. Grab your Bibles. Open up to the book of Philippians. If you are able, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Open up to Philippians chapter 4. Uh, if you need a Bible, grab one of those blue hardback Bibles. Turn to page 1,166. Uh, we're actually finishing our sermon series on Philippians today. I will finish up this chapter Wednesday night in our online Bible study. Today we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 through 9. I'd love for everybody to have a copy of God's Word in front of them. If you don't have a Bible, take one of those blue Bibles home with you. We would love for you to have God's Word. Uh, also, I want to congratulate Joy on her upcoming sabbatical. If you want to know when my sabbatical is, it is in two years and a month and a half. And I promise you I'm not also counting. I'm looking forward to my own 10-week study leave uh, and rest. Uh, with that in mind, friends, let's look at Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 through 9. Paul is wrapping up his letter to the church in Philippi as he writes from a prison cell. So don't ever forget that the words of Paul should echo in your minds as if coming through a prison cell. Paul writes, I entreat Euodia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Friends, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God remains forever. This is the word of the Lord. And then would you be seated as you keep that Bible open in front of you and as we pray. Uh, o God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, we ask by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would give us the mindset of Jesus. Lord, would you make our hearts yearn to be peacemakers? For you are our peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Is peace boring? Is peace boring? I can confess, when I was like a teenager and I would go to church and the pastor would talk about peace, I was like, ah, oh, this is so boring. Have you ever been a teenager? Do you remember those days for some of you in the room? Imagine when your parents said, we're not doing anything this weekend. And what did you think? Oh, man, my parents are so boring. They don't do anything. So I have to confess that when we talk about peace, you may have this wrong idea of what peace is. You know, maybe you're thinking peace is for the weak or peace is so boring. I like to get into it. I like to do things. Uh, but when we talk about peace, we have to recognize what we're talking about and why peace is so beautiful and compelling. Peace is compelling. Let me kind of uh, argue from reverse. Think about it this way. Um, do you like it when there's conflict with people? Do you like having conflict with people? Do you like when there's conflict in your family? If you don't, then what do you hope for? What you would hope for is peace. Or do you just like feeling anxious? Do you like drowning in anxiety and worry? You know, it's been said by many sociologists that we live in the age of anxiety and worry. Do you like feeling anxious and worried? Do you like having an inability to be present? Well, imagine if you could swim to the top of the sea of anxiety and just poke your head out. What far shore would you actually want to land on? What would you want to let go of in anxiety, and what would you want to take hold of? Or do you like feeling like you and I are constantly at war with the people around us, and we are here to be culture warriors? Do you ever wish 
instead of constantly fighting with everyone, that somehow we would figure out how to stand up for what we believe in and somehow also be known by a reputation of being a peacemaker? What does Jesus say? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the news TV channel anchors. No, that's not what he says. <laughs> Blessed are the po- political pontificators. Is that what, no, what does he say? Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. So how do I stand up for what I believe in in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation? And yet, how am I still known by reputation as someone who is a peace doer, a peacemaker? Uh, If any of those are compelling to you, what I would suggest is you look in your heart is actually what your heart is yearning for uh, is not a boring way of life. What you're actually yearning for is what the Bible calls peace. In Hebrew, the word for peace is famously what? Shalom. It's tattooed on many forearms in our state. Right? It's the only Hebrew word many people know, but it means peace, shalom. In Greek, does anybody know in the New Testament written in Greek what the Greek word for peace is? It's a, it's a lady's name that starts with the letter I. Oh, come on. Irene. Irene. Any ladies lucky enough to have the name Irene is the name peace. Uh, Cornelius Platinga is kind of an erudite dude. He's a philosopher at Calvin University, but he gave probably the most famous Christian definition of peace ever. Uh, Platinga wrote, Shalom, when the Bible talks about peace, right? When it talks about irene, peace, it's not just talking about not having conflict. It's not saying, well, then there's no more war. It's actually something way deeper than that. So if we don't want wars to happen in places like Ukraine, what is it that we actually want? And if we want children to live in this world and be born into the land of the living, what is it that we want for them when they're alive? What is it that we actually want? Well, Platinga would say, by the Holy Spirit, Christians want peace. Shalom, Irene. Platinga defines it like this, though. Shalom is not just the end of warfare. It is the webbing together of God, humans, and all creation in justice, fulfillment, and delight. This is what the Old Testament prophets called shalom, the interwebbing of God, humans, and all of creation as it should be. And what's amazing is there is an outpost for this way of life. There is a place you can find this peace. And there's a people who are marked by this peace. In fact, this peace is expected of them, and they are called to it and empowered into it. And it's found in the church through believers who take the words of God seriously, who are indwelled by the Spirit. So as Paul is writing to Christians in Philippi, as he's writing from that jail cell, which makes us listen a little bit more intently, especially when he says things like rejoice always. Paul is going to talk about peace, and he gives us sort of three realms that you and I are to pursue peace. So let's look at verses 2 and 3, and I want you to see how Paul expects peace in the church between believers. Paul writes in verse 2, he says, I entreat Euodia, which is a lady's name. If you didn't know that, that's a lady's name. (laughs) It did not pass through the annals of time, unfortunately. He says, I entreat Euodia, and I entreat Syntyche, also a lady's name, to do what? To agree in the Lord. Paul grammatically is showing us that he's not picking sides between these two Christians. He says, I entreat Euodia, and I entreat Syntyche. He does not say it's her fault, and it's definitely she's the victim. He says, look, I am entreating both of these women to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, true companion, whoever this guy is, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Notice right there, verses 2 and 3, Paul expects peace from the church, and the church is empowered to demonstrate peace, right? The webbing together, the reconciliation, the mercy of God in his relationships to each other. But how do you and I pursue peace? especially when it comes to another Christian. Okay, step back for a second. Think about this. Paul is writing a letter to the entire church, and at the end of it, he names names. 
Have you ever been in a sermon where I've called you out by name? And some people are like, oh, sometimes I feel like you're speaking right to me. And I'm like, praise God. But I try to refrain from being like, and you by your sin. You know, Jimmy, could you imagine if we were that kind of church? What kind of trust? does Paul have for these women? Well, he calls them laborers, co-laborers, side by side, and he mentions guys like Clement. Paul often mentions people's names, and we shouldn't see it as a sign of disrespect. It's a sign that these women were very influential in the church, and apparently there had been a conflict between two very important leaders in the church, and Paul, because it's a public conflict, apparently has to address it somewhat publicly, and he doesn't want to pick sides between two believers. Instead, he gives you and I a manual for how to address conflict with other Christians. Euodia and Syntyche. There's conflict. I mean, could you imagine two ladies in the church not seeing eye to eye about something? I know it's hard to imagine. But this is not just a guide for women. This is a guide for men as well. It's a guide for how do you and I respond when we have conflict with other Christians. Um, Unfortunately, you know, I think what a lot of Christians do when we have conflict with other Christians, um, probably the most famous story I can give of this. How do we have, what do we do when we have conflict with other Christians? The most famous you know, story um, it was actually about a guy who got deserted on an island. And he was, all, he was there all by himself for something like 12 years, totally alone. And after 12 years, finally a boat you know, came by and picked him up or whatever. And anyways, he's, as he's leaving on the boat, you know, famously... The captain of the boat says to this guy, he says, hey, dude, you've been on this island for 12 years all by yourself? And he's like, yeah. And the captain says, well, what are those three buildings you built? And the guy says, oh, well, that first one's my house. And the second one is my church. And the third one is my old church. (laughs) Some of you get that joke. It's funny because he's all by himself. Anyway, the point is, point is, it seems like when there's conflict with other Christians, we're like reaching for something on our tool belt and we don't seem to know what it is. So Paul's going to give you some things to put on your tool belt. And it's so beautiful. The first thing in verse 2 is what? If you have conflict with another Christian, you have to step back, Christian, and recognize that you agree with this person on something much more fundamental than what the color of the carpet in the historic church is going to be or any other issue. If you have conflict with another Christian, the very basis of mercy and reasonableness and gentleness is to agree in the Lord. I don't agree with you on this. I don't agree with you on that. I don't agree with you on this. And I may never see eye to eye with you on what just happened, but when it comes to addressing conflict, we agree in Christ Jesus. And Paul double clicks on that. At the very end of verse 3, he says, Remember, ladies, that both of your names are written in the book of life. You know what? That's, that's Old Testament language for what? What does that mean? My future is heaven. I praise God. My future is heaven. Paul says when you and I have conflict with other Christians, step back, take a breath, and remember to agree in Christ Jesus. You love Jesus, I love Jesus. You take up your cross, and I take up my cross. Your name is written in the book of life, and our future together is heaven. That should uh, at least take out some of the bullets in the revolver. Maybe not all of them. Verse 3, Paul goes on. He gives more of a manual. He says, yes, I ask you also, true companion, uh, this is a in, in, the, in the Greek, this is a, a male person based on the gender of the phrasing, so we don't know who this guy is. But Paul says, I ask you, true companion, help these women. Sometimes things are so difficult between Christians that who is needed? An intermediary, a mediator, someone to intercede to help these women. We don't know who this true companion is. Uh, I tend to think it's a guy named Epaphroditus, because he is a guy who's bringing this letter back to the Philippians. So Paul's writing this letter saying, hey, those two people in conflict, they need to get along, and hey, my really good friend, help them do this. So Epaphroditus makes the most sense, but we don't know who this is. But this is a reminder that sometimes you and I need the church to resolve conflict. We need an intermediary. We need someone to put a hand on both of the people and bring peace. 
And then Paul wants these women to remember how many years they have labored side by side for the gospel. So don't lose sight of that. There may be a conflict, but you agree in Christ Jesus, you're headed for heaven together. I'm going to give somebody who can help out. And then also remember that you have labored for years together in the gospel. And then he says, he calls the whole church to be aware of this. He says, remember Clement and the rest of my fellow workers. You know, uh, who is that Clement right there? Why does Paul mention that? Uh, it, you know, we don't know who Clement is. There's an early, early church father named Clement. He wrote a letter called First Clement, not in the Bible. It, this may be him, but it's probably not him for a bunch of reasons. Uh, why would Paul mention Clement? You know, it'd be like, hey, you know, Sally and Susie, get along, you know. And also, don't forget about Clement over there. Why would he mention Clement? Clement is Latin for a certain word. It's a certain word. Um, and I'm going to make you guess it. What does the word clemency mean? If you give a prisoner clemency, what does that mean? You've shown him what? Mercy. What do you think the name Clement means? Yeah, he's saying, hey, there's a conflict in the church. Maybe you need an intermediary. But hey, remember, your names are written in the book of life. Remember, you're headed for heaven. And don't forget about my buddy Mercy over there. <laughs> Paul expects peace in the church, then the church is empowered by the Spirit to help with it. The question is, are we going to have the mindset of Jesus? Are we going to keep mercy in mind? Are we going to look to our interests only or look to the interests of others? Uh, continuing on in verses 4 through 7, Paul now, uh, it's going to seem like Paul's hitting all of these random topics, and in a way he is because he's wrapping up his letter. But peace is the, is the thread running through this tapestry, okay? And he's going to give some kind of staccato statements, right? And the first thing he's going to say is he wants us to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness, that reasonableness means kind of gentleness. It, it leans towards gentle. So think about a reasonable person is patient and gentle. You know, be reasonable, right? And then he says the Lord is near. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is close by. So don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So to recap very quickly, I'm suggesting to you that Paul expects peace from the church. And he gives you and I a manual for working towards it, remembering our names are written in the book of life remembering the gospel, agreeing in the Lord, even if we don't agree on everything else. But now, you know, some of you are thinking, well, I don't have any big conflict with anybody, but I do feel in many ways that I swim in a sea of anxiety and worry. Uh, the best definition I've ever heard of anxiety is the inability to be present. There, it's like, you know, you know some, remember old TVs where you used to turn a knob and it did something? And every now and then you go on something that's not a channel, and it's like, like the white noise. Um, in some ways, anxiety is like having white noise on just all of the time. It's not so much a thing as it is sort of a state of being. And this is why it's so difficult to get out of anxiety, because we don't even know how to put our finger on it. It's just a state of being. It's just what we are. It just follows us. Um, uh, Lynn Kohek, a professor at Wheaton, uh, described uh, anxiety as worrying that does nothing to help solve the problem. You know, which is helpful as we remember, you know, as we struggle with anxiety and as we live in the midst of an anxiety, you know, problem in our, our country and our world, just ask yourself, what's your, are you anxious? How's that working out for you? Is it helping you at all? Chances are it's not helping. In fact, it's just sort of like having white noise on. It's a state of being. So does the gospel speak to any of that? You know, it's interesting. I went up to Oregon City this past weekend for our uh, denominational meeting. I went up to Oregon City uh, which is a place, as I discovered. I did not know there was such a thing as Oregon City in Oregon. Seems redundant. The worst thing was, it was first press of Oregon City, and it was on Oregon City Street. No, I'm just kidding. It wasn't on there, but I half expected it to be. Uh, but we were there, and we got an update on the mental health of pastors in our denomination. And guess what percentage is on antidepressants and struggling with anxiety and worry? 60%. So I'm going to go ahead and project that on to most lay people, because I don't think pastors are all that different in some of this. So you could say that you and I are swimming in a sea of anxiety. It's our inability to be present. Uh, it's our desire to build another church building on the island as we live by ourselves, right? Does the gospel help us with any of this? 
I'm not saying don't take anti-anxiety medicine, but try to listen to what Paul's actually saying to you. He's writing from the prison cell, after all. And he says to do what? Number one, rejoice in the Lord always. Divorce your feeling of peace from your circumstances. Your circumstances do not determine your peace. Your peace is determined by your ability to rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord, even if your circumstances are not good. What does it mean to rejoice, though? Does that mean I'm supposed to be, like, happy all the time? Is that what the Bible means when it says rejoice, just be happy, slap a smile on my face? You know, it's always amazing to me how many walls people put up. You know, when I was at this pastor's conference, I spent five hours hanging out with these other pastors in the Airbnb, and it probably wasn't until hour three that everyone finally got real and started talking about all the horrible things going on in their private lives and the pain they were going through. And I was like, well, that was a big old waste of three hours. Why didn't we get real before that? Well, we got to take the walls down, right? People are coming up with coping mechanisms. But what is it that you and I are supposed to do, even if we're trying to find coping mechanisms? Well, Paul says, instead, rejoice in the Lord. Or what does it mean to rejoice? Just be happy? That's not going to help me. Uh, Tim Keller's a pastor in New York City. Uh, he's a couple years into stage four pancreatic cancer. And Professor, or Dr. Keller, uh, in his book, Counterfeit Gods, The Deceptive Lies of Pleasure, Possessions, and Money, uh, wrote these words. He says, to rejoice is to treasure a thing. So as you read this quote, examine your own heart. Think about this. Does your heart do this? To rejoice is to treasure a thing, to assess its value to you, to reflect on its beauty and importance until your heart rests in it and tastes the sweetness of it. Rejoicing is a way of praising God until the heart is sweetened and rested and until it relaxes its grip on anything else it thinks it needs. The anxious, if I just get this, if this conflict would go away, if this thing would change in my life, if this circumstance, then I could relax. But rejoicing is possible in the midst of worry. We learn to delight in something better than this world, but to delight in God. He really has done something, what he's done. Your future really is heaven. Your sins are forgiven. God loves you. He is close by. Relax your grip a little bit. Rejoice, even in the midst of your circumstances. Paul says another antidote to anxiety is to be reasonable, be gentle. Don't try to slam everybody. Be reasonable. Paul goes on in verse 5, and he reminds us that what? God is close by. What does he mean by the Lord is at hand? At hand is a specific Greek term, which means close. So there's always this fun debate about, does Paul mean that Jesus is like right about to return? Is that what he means? Like the Jesus could come back this afternoon. Is that what Paul's saying? Or is he saying that God is close in the sense that your spirit and God's spirit are like this? And there's nowhere you can go that God's spirit isn't right at your right hand. I think the most honest answer is Paul means both of those things. Christ is going to return and make all things new. And in the meantime, he's in this with you. He is in you, in you and with you as you battle anxiety. There's no, the God does not step up in heaven like I would and be like, all right, when you stop worrying, I'll come out and help you. He doesn't say, once you figure out this anxiety thing, then I'll get into your life. He's with you. Um, you know, one of the hard things about anxiety is trying to explain it to people because um, it's not a thing and it's not always a circumstance. It's a state of being. You know, it's just this thing that we think, seem to think that we are, right? I'm, just, I, I'm an anxious. But imagine if you didn't have to explain your anxiety to anybody? What if you didn't have to put words to it? What if God already knew? You don't have to explain your worry to God. He knows. He understands. And he's in it with you. He's in it with you. He gets it. Paul says the Lord is at hand. So now Paul's going to tell us to do something. He says, don't be anxious. And many of us think, well, that's real helpful. It's like telling somebody, don't worry. Calm down. Almost never works. But Paul gives us advice. He gives us a way forward, something to do. He says, in everything by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And notice Paul does not simply just say, pray about it, which 
people never do when someone says that. Well, just pray about it. Well, that's like saying, I'll pray for you, and then you never do. What Paul is getting at is a deeper sense of prayer. Notice that he mentions supplication and thanksgiving. Supplication, it's a famous, you know, word in prayer, you know, teachings, but we almost never use it in day-to-day life. What does supplication mean? Supplication is when you ask God to supply what you need. And so if you notice in our worship service, we follow a a particular pattern of prayer, and we follow the ACTS prayer method, A-C-T-S. It's adoration, so we praise God for who he is. Then we confess our sin. We say, God, I'm sorry. And then we go to T, which is what? Thanksgiving. And then lastly, the fourth step of the Acts prayer method is supplication. Then you ask God to help you or you ask him for things. Notice that Paul mentions at least two of those in this passage. But what's so helpful about the Acts prayer method is you focus your attention on God. You remember that he's on the throne. Maybe you loosen your grip just a little bit on the thing that's causing you anxiety. Maybe you need to remember, I did contribute to the conflict. Lord, forgive me as I confess my sin. Then you thank God for what he's done, and then you ask God to supply what you need. Paul says there is no other way out of this that does not include, at least in some part, prayer. Prayer is the thing where we go and we join in the presence of God. And he knows And God God promises that he will guard your heart. Notice verse 7. He says, if you do this, if you go to the Lord genuinely in prayer, God will guard your hearts and your minds. You know, what I find so helpful about about all of this uh, um, is when it comes to prayer, we're really bad at praying. Many people struggle with prayer. Uh, Some people are great at it, but that seems to be the exception, not the norm. The most norm is like, someone's like, will you pray for me? And you're like, yeah. And then you're like, happy thoughts. And then you forget all about it. (laughs) At least one person thought that was funny and actually was honest. Many of us don't know how to pray. Uh, But as I've reflected on this, twice in this section, Paul says, imitate me. Okay? In verse uh, Philippians 3.17, he says, imitate me. And then in our very passage in verse 9, he says, what you've learned from me and seen in me, do what I'm doing. So, you know, in that same sort of pastoral sense, uh, I'm going to say imitate me in this. Uh, This is my calendar and my prayer journal. I've kept one since I was converted to Christ in college. I've got about, you know, I don't know, 16 of them on my shelf. I take notes every day, and many of you are in this by name. Many of you have your names written in this journal, and I pray for you. I pray for y'all that I like and pray for the ones that I hope to like one day. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I pray for our church constantly. And what's great about keeping a prayer journal is I do what? I remember to pray for you. And then what's even more beautiful is every now and then the winds of another world blow through this world. And I get to check off the prayer request is answered. Do you have a prayer journal? You know what you could do? You could get a journal and just write A C T S. Here's what I adore God for. Here's some sins I need to repent of. God, thank you for this, 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 and this. And here's how I need you to show up in my life. And the amazing thing is, God says, if you go to the Lord in prayer, He will guard your heart. He'll guard your heart and your mind. Imitate me in having a prayer journal. There's worse things than you could do. Great way to start the morning uh, with your prayer journal and coffee. Let me finish up. Verses 8 through 9, uh, Paul says, Finally, brothers, and like a good pastor, he's not actually done when he says finally. Still like 12 more verses to get through. Paul says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Uh, What I love so much about this section is where Paul turns, because he turns down sort of a path that you don't think he's going to. Right, So in the first section, Paul's saying, here's how Christians extend peace to each other. Agree in the Lord. Remember their names are written in the book of life. And maybe find a mediator. Pretty simple, right? Agree in the Lord. And then he says, for you struggling with anxiety, don't live by anxiety. 
have you know, inner peace. I tried to find another phrase in that, but it's true. How do you have peace in your heart? What he says is rejoice. Let go of the grip of the thing that you think you need and love God. And then give the Lord the things that you are concerned about and let him act. Right? Pray. Present your request to God. But now he enters in kind of a different realm. And he's actually going to speak to how you and I live in the world as Christians in a world that does not agree with us on everything. How do you and I still see the good, the true, and the beautiful in this world? Maintaining our faith in Christ and yet also trying to reach those in our world that don't agree with us, that we love, that we reach the mission field. Verse 8 is very interesting to me. Um, some of you know I've been working on a doctor of ministry for about five years, and my topic has been virtue, uh, which is a moral excellency, a good habit, and how Christians acquire virtues. But what's really interesting, in Paul's day, non-Christians were like crazy about virtues. You heard of Aristotle and the four cardinal virtues, you know, justice, prudence, courage, fortitude, all that stuff. What's interesting about this list is this list does not come from, you know, a Bible verse. Paul's not quoting the Old Testament. What he's doing is he's pulling from his broader culture, and he's saying, look, what your world loves, they, they recognize when something is true that that is good. The world knows what sometimes things are lovely and what is honorable. So as you live your Christian life in the world, try to find points of connection with people, even non-Christians, about what is good, true, and beautiful. If you see something good... If you see something praiseworthy, praise it. Here's an easy example. If you meet somebody who adopts a child, praise God. You know, I think sometimes we think that our only message to the broader world is, sin, you are bad. And there is a sense, right? There is a sense that we all need to repent that we're all sinners. But there's also a sense that you and I are peacemakers, and we walk into communities, and we work in places, and you are called to places of work where you pursue anything that is good or true or beautiful, and you praise it. And Paul says, look, if there's any virtue in your world, if there's anything good, true, or beautiful that you see, focus on that. Start with that. Now, of course, we all know that what the world will define as good, true, and beautiful is, can be very different than what Christians call good, true, or beautiful, right? What the world says is true is what? Whatever you say is true is true. What Christians say is true is what? Jesus is the truth, right? The world says women are most beautiful when they look like Instagram models, right? You look on Instagram, what's a beautiful woman? Well, you can see a lot of examples of it. But what does the Bible say makes a mother beautiful or a woman beautiful? A meek and gentle spirit, the inner beauty. Don't let your beauty be external. Let it be the inner character where you are like Jesus. But when you see beauty and truth and goodness in this world, name it. Now, of course, we know the difference uh, between what the world says is right and beautiful and true. And that's why Paul says, as you go out into this world seeking to be a peacemaker, don't ever forget the teachings of the apostles, the teachings of the church, in Holy Scripture. Look at verse 9. He says, as you seek to try to find with your neighbors and your coworkers that which is good, true, and beautiful, he says, but don't forget this, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Paul's saying, do so with a Bible in your hand. Do so in line with Christian teaching. And if you seek to stand up for God's truth and to be a peacemaker, I know that is very difficult, but God promises that he will be with you as you do that. Look at verse 9. And the God of peace will be with you. Uh, many of us uh, face difficult jobs, uh, whether it's education or the medical world or just any office right now. We're all trying to figure out how do we exude the mercy and the love of Jesus, but also the truth of Jesus. Those are very difficult questions to be wrestling with. But what does Paul say? Whatever is good, whatever is lovely, focus on that. But don't forget the teachings that I have given you. What you have learned and received in me, that's the test for all of these other things. So let me just finish with a little bit of homework, okay? Uh, it's Mother's Day, and this would make your mother very proud 
Uh, so please write this down. If you are going to you know, imitate me and have a prayer journal, this week would be a great week to start that new habit. Uh, here's what I'd like for you to do in your prayer journal. I think it would be very helpful for you spiritually. Uh, step back and ask yourself this. How does the world define what is... You're, no one's writing this down. What are you waiting for? Are you going to remember this? <laughs> write down in your journal what the world says is good, true, and beautiful. How does the world define what is good, true, and beautiful? And don't just find the bad. Try to find sometimes when the world's right, when the broader culture's right. Right? Like the ADA, great law, praise God. American with Disabilities Act, Civil Rights Act, great. What is good, true, and beautiful? Now I'll say, well, where is the culture wrong about what is good, true, and beautiful? Right? How does the world define good, true, and beautiful? Then the most important thing, how does Jesus define the good, the true, and the beautiful? And then when you're done, think about those things. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you that you send us out as your peacemakers. Lord, we praise you that you are the God of peace. Lord, that we can experience the peace of God. Uh, Lord, we lift up our church especially and all of the Rogue Valley churches. Uh, Lord, today we think of Medford Friends Church, and Lord, we pray that these would be peace incubators. Uh, Lord, that we would experience your peace and we would also be extending it to others. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would guard our hearts and our minds as we go out to our workplaces and we engage the world. Uh, Holy Spirit, we need your truth and we need your mercy. Uh, Lord, the only person that knew how to speak truth in love perfectly was your son, Jesus. So, Father, I ask in his name that everyone listening to me would know how to do those very same things to your glory, that they would speak the truth in love. Lord, that they would be peacemakers in their homes and in their relationships. Lord, in their places of work and in their neighborhoods. Lord, we lift to you those who are struggling right now in need of your healing. Lord, we pray for Randy Templeton and also Lori, Mac Peffley, Sean McCoy, Harry Gilg, Lorraine Hoffman, Colleen Eccleston, John Esser, Paul Deller, and Lynn Toombs. God, have mercy on each one of them. And Lord, we pray this month for Brent O'Neill, and we ask that you would continue him in his ministry for many years to college students in Bend. And Lord, would you leverage all of the work that he does for your glory. And Lord, would you bless the work of his hands and crew as they seek to use the outdoors to reveal the God of creation in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, be with us, and Lord, may we take up our cross and follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.